caring for the person. For effective care, you must consider the whole person. The whole person has physical, social, psychological, and spiritual parts. All these parts are interwoven. If there's something wrong with one part, it, it can affect every system. Every part relates to and depends on the others. Disability and illness affect the whole person. So even though they may not have any problems with their mind, if they can't walk, of course that's going to upset them and it will affect every body system. So we have to help them. Address the resident properly, we mentioned before. Call them by their titles, Mr. or Mrs. Dr. So-and-so, until they tell you otherwise. And if they do tell you otherwise, make sure that's added to the care plan. So when someone else goes into the room, they don't have to be told, um, you don't have to call me Mr., just call me Bill, or whatever. So make sure that that's on the care plan so you won't be accused of being disrespectful. Um, don't call them by any other name unless they ask you to. There's residents that a lot of them have nicknames and if they want to be called that, that has to be on the care plan and you may address them in that way. Don't ever call them grandma, papa, sweetheart, honey, or any other name. And I've had to remind students, even though you do live in Kentucky and everybody goes by honey, you can't do that. These are our elders and they should be respected. And it can be hard. You have to catch yourself and don't call them sweetie and honey even though that they're, they're tiny little bitty helpless little people but you have to remember they're adults they are our elders basic needs according to abraham maslow um, <clears throat> excuse me abraham maslow was a famous psychologist and he created a pyramid of needs um, according to abraham basic needs must be met for a person to survive and function the lower needs must be met before the higher needs. They're listed in order from the lower level up and it is a pyramid. From the lowest level, physiological or physical needs. This includes oxygen, food, water, elimination, followed by safety and security. We all have to be safe and secure and that includes feeling safe and secure. When you tell someone, especially an older, frail, helpless person that they're going to be admitted to a nursing home, they're scared. There's a stigma that goes with nursing homes. They watch TV. What are you going to do? Go in there, get a bed sore, get dehydrated, fall, break a hip. You're going to have to call the man. I better do it now. They're scared. So when they come into the facility, we have to let them know we're here for you. Whatever you need, let us know. And you have to be patient with them. Followed by love and belonging needs. Not just romantic love, but that somebody cares about you. My life matters. Someone will come and talk to me today. And there's a lot of these folks that don't have anybody, or they do have people that don't care anymore. We are all they have. So it's very important that you stop, say hello, how are you feeling today, and sincerely mean it, not just say it to be sociable. Self-esteem needs. We all need good self-esteem, and you have to have good self-esteem. When you walk in that room, they should feel your confidence and encourage them, help them comb their hair, help them dress appropriately, encourage them to be out of their room and among other people. And then finally, the need for self-actualization. Striving and growing to the full potential. And most people never get there, but they try. We need goals, everybody needs goals every day. Most people meet their own needs, but those in long-term care centers need help or they wouldn't be there. So, um, just from working, a lot of the clients, whenever you work with them long time, they get close to you. What do you do whenever you, they say, like, get so attached, they say they love you every time you leave, or how do you address that when you're leaving? That's okay. They probably do love you. And for some people, when you're not with them anymore, they become very depressed. But at least for the time that you are with them, they do have that safety, security, love and belonging feeling. And Again, it's typically not romantic love. If it comes to that point, then you need to have someone take your place because that does happen as well. But if it's just the feeling of belonging and security, it's okay. And honestly, I've loved some of my patients, a lot of them. <laughs> you get to that point. Culture and religion. Culture is the characteristics of a group of people passed from one generation to the next. 
Culture can influence health beliefs and practices and also behavior during illness and when someone is in a nursing center. And it's good to know their culture and that should be on their care plan as well. Things that they believe, things that make them feel better that typically would not affect someone else or things that are insulting to them that would not be to someone else. <clears throat> Religion relates to spiritual beliefs, needs, and practices. Religion influences health and illness practices. Many people find comfort and strength from religion during illness. And if you have someone that asks you to see a priest or a pastor or a rabbi, let the nurse know. If they don't have their own, they can call a church or a synagogue or a cathedral and get someone to help meet those um, spiritual needs. And don't judge them by your own beliefs. The nursing process will reflect the person's culture and religion. And again, don't judge them by your standards. They're just different. They're not wrong. So always be respectful. The effects of illness and disability. Sickness and injury have physical, psychological, and social effects. Anger is a common response to illness and disability. To help the person feel safe, secure, and loved, take an extra minute to visit. Hold their hand. Give them a hug. Show that you're willing to help with personal needs. When they turn on their light, respond promptly. That's one of the biggest complaints. I've waited 20 minutes for someone to answer this light. Treat every person with respect and dignity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Highest potential, optimal level of function. Residents are helped to maintain their optimal level of function. They may not be what they were 20 years ago, but let them be the most they can be. Encourage them to do what they can for themselves, to be as independent as possible, and always focus on ability, not disability. Encourage them, always. Okay. Nursing center residents. Some of them are alert and oriented. Alert means they can respond um, respond to you appropriately. Oriented means they know person, place, and time. They know who they are, where they are, and the time. Not necessarily the time of day. They may not even know what day of the week this is. But they might, you might ask them, do you know what season this is? Do you know what year this is? Um, confused and disoriented residents. Um, these folks need a lot of help, not always for physical reasons, but they don't know where they are and they don't know how to respond appropriately. Complete care residents. They might be in a coma, they might be completely paralyzed, but they need complete care. Short-term residents, maybe they're just there for therapy and once they meet their therapy goals, they get to go home. Or they might be there for respite. Their family went on a two weeks vacation, they're not up to the travel, so they come and stay until the family comes back. Lifelong residents, you have folks that are born without a chance and they're admitted to a facility early in life and they stay in a facility all their life. I had the pleasure of meeting a young lady in a nursing home who had been a lifelong resident. Her mother was a drug user. When this, she was a baby, I'm gonna call her Mary. I never use real names. But Mary, uh, they found out, had, was affected by all of that drug use. She also had fetal alcohol syndrome. She was admitted to the Home for the Innocent in Louisville, and they raised her there. When I talked to the social worker, she said that at the age of 12, Mary started to show signs of being able to learn. That if they said, where's the blue? She couldn't say blue, but she could point to blue. And they had so much confidence that she was gonna be able to learn. And then Mary had a stroke. And it affected her a lot. And she didn't show any more signs. But she did show emotion. She could cry, she could smile, she could laugh. She could make a face when she was angry. And then she came to live with us when she was 19 in a nursing home. And she was beautiful. She'd never been exposed to the sun or bad food or anything like the rest of us. And we put her in a room with a lady who was mean, hateful mean. And her family said she'd been like that all her life. So at first she was really mean to Mary. When Mary cried, she would come out in the hall, somebody take care of her, she's keeping me awake. And, but then finally she started to adopt Mary. She called her family, bring me storybooks, bring me stuffed animals, I can do something for this girl. And she would sit by her bed and read to her. So for this mean little woman, she finally found something that gave her purpose. And Mary had a friend that was by her side all the time. Shortly after Mary came, she wasn't there six months and she had another massive stroke and died. Her new friend died three months later. So there is a reason, okay? 
Um, and then you have mentally ill residents. These folks can't adjust to stress. Um, they have a lot of hard time being secure and safe, and we have to help them. The terminally ill resident, these are folks that are dying, aren't we all? But these folks are dying soon. They have a terminally ill diagnosis. It might be a few months. It might be less than a year. Um, some of them know and some of them don't. But whatever the case, again, always respect and always take care of them to the best of your ability. Behaviors. People who don't adjust well have some of the following behaviors. Anger, um, very, very common. You might have people yell at you, strike out at you, spit at you, pull your hair, and you walk away. Like I mentioned before, you cannot get angry back. For whatever the reason they're angry, we have to find out and help them to relax. Some folks have demanding behavior. They want everything now, and when they get it, it's not good enough. Self-centered behavior, it's all about me. I don't care about my roommate who's suffering. It's all about me. Aggressive behaviors, again, they fight with you. They may try to strike you. Withdrawal, they may be depressed, and they don't want to be around anyone. Inappropriate sexual behaviors. Sometimes you have people that don't know what they're doing, and they might try to touch you inappropriately, or sometimes they do know what they're doing. But for whatever the reason, you always stop them and tell them, don't do that, I don't like it, and report it. Report all these behaviors to the nurse. Even if it's normal for them, it's still not normal behavior. And doctors can't treat anything that's not documented. So they have to have a reason, and it has to be a documented reason. Behaviors may be unpleasant, but you cannot avoid the person. You can't lose control. Good communication is needed, and follow the care plan. So again, if you find something that works, share it with everybody else and get those um, helpful things onto the care plan where other people can see them. Um, effective communication. Use words that have the meaning for you, the same meaning for you as for the person you're talking to. Avoid medical terms and words that are not familiar to the person. Communicate in a logical, orderly manner. Give facts, be specific, be brief and concise. Understand and respect the resident as a person. View them as a physical, psychological, social and spiritual human being. They are not just a job. Appreciate their problems and frustrations. Respect their rights, always. Respect their religion and their culture. Give the person time to process the information you have given, especially the elderly. Sometimes it takes them a second to, co to comprehend what you just said, or maybe they didn't hear you. Ask questions to see if they understood, and be patient. Include the person in conversations when others are present. I see that a lot. You'll have two people talking to each other. They walk into a room to take care of the resident. They continue their conversation as if that person is not even there. That's rude. If nothing else, it's rude. Include them in the conversation. So when you walk into the room and you're talking to your buddy about UK almost made it to the semifinals or whatever you're talking about, include them in the conversation. Did you get to watch the game? Who's your favorite team? And you'll be surprised. They will respond. So to, about like respecting their rights and things like that, um, just calling Kind of going back, it says like you don't want to objectify the person to a thing, and people refer to them as 12A needs this or whatever. Right. If you say their name, would it that almost be like a privacy invasion if you're like speaking out loud? Out loud because somebody could be in the hallway that they don't want knowing mm -hmm. like where they are. Um, you can use room numbers when you're in the hall, like you just said. Yeah. You don't want to breach confidentiality yeah. or by saying their name, but um, when you're in the room. You don't want to refer to them yeah. as a number or um, I'm here to change clothes in bed for bed two. I'm here to change clothes for Mrs. Smith. So always address them appropriately. But you're right, you cannot divulge information in the hall. Okay, for verbal communication, follow these rules for spoken communication. Always face the person. Position yourself at eye level. Control the volume and tone of your voice. Speak clearly, slowly, and distinctly. If they don't hear you, speak a little bit louder. Let them see your face. Let them watch your lips move when you talk. 
and that helps as well. Do not use slang or vulgar words. Repeat information as needed. Ask one question at a time. Sometimes if you go in the room and say, are you cold? Do you want me to get you a sweater? I'm cold. Yes. Do I want a sweater? Yes. Okay, so the answer is yes. That's two questions. So ask one question at a time. Um, don't shout, whisper, or mumble. Be kind, courteous, and friendly. The written word is used when the person can't speak or hear, but they can read. And you'll be surprised how many people can. My daughter was telling me an example. She went into a patient's room. She had a new admission. And um, again, I don't use real names. So she went in. She said, good morning, Mr. Smith. My name's Casey. I'll be taking care of you today. And he kept trying to say something. He'd had a stroke and he couldn't speak. He couldn't enunciate words. He could just make sound. And he kept trying and trying. And she went down the list. You want to drink a water? You need to go to the restroom. Can I get you something to eat? Do you need to move? And he couldn't make her understand. And she said, wait just a minute, wait just a minute. And she went to the desk and came back with paper and pencil. And with little second grade handwriting, he wrote, Matt, M-A-T-T, and held it up. And she said, oh, you want me to call you Matt? And she said he shook his head like she had just given him a barrel of gold. And he was so happy that she understood. So sometimes those little things can really be helpful. Other, there's other ways to communicate as well. Some people might have a book with pictures and they flip to the page and point to that. Um, one lady where we do clinicals, she has a book of words, common words that she uses. And if you can't understand her, she'll flip to the, it's in alphabetical order, her daughter made it for her. And so she was trying to tell me something. She was on the phone with her daughter. And so she said, she kept pointing to the book. I didn't have on my glasses. So she gave me the phone, and I took the phone, and I said, hello, this is he. And the lady said, hi, I'm her daughter. She's trying to tell me something, and I don't understand. And I said, well, in her book, it's um, tuna. I guess she wants tuna for lunch. And the lady said, what? We weren't talking about lunch. And I said, well, let me find my glasses. I said, oh, it says Tina. And she said, oh, she wants me to call Tina for her. I said, okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't communicate well either. Um, <laughs> But there are a lot of ways people can communicate. And if you can figure it out, share it with everybody because <coughs> that's a good thing to do. Um, Nonverbal communication. Messages are sent with gestures, facial expressions, posture, body movement, touch, and smell. But touch means different things to different people. So if you want to hold someone's hand and they pull away, they may not like to be touched. And that's okay too. People send messages through their body language with facial expressions, eye contact, posture, gait, how do you enter the room? Maybe you came to work angry. You're not angry at the residence. You're not angry at, the, at your boss. You're angry at your boyfriend because he made you late for work. So you storm into the room, you open the closet, you throw out the clothes. The resident's sitting there thinking you're angry at them. And it's frightening. So pay attention to those things. Gestures, hand and body movements, appearance is another form of nonverbal communication. The way you look. So the way you look is perceived differently by different people. Okay, communication methods. Listening, excuse me, means to focus on verbal and nonverbal communication. Paraphrasing, restating the person's message in your own words. Direct questions focus on certain information. Open-ended questions invite the person to share thoughts, feelings, or ideas. Clarifying lets you make sure you understood or that they understand the message. Focusing is dealing with a certain topic. Silence can be a very powerful way to communicate. Sometimes just being with someone helps them feel safe. Barriers. Using unfamiliar language. Um, cultural differences. Changing the subject. Giving your opinion. Talking a lot when others are silent. Sometimes people with a hearing deficit will try to control conversations because they can't hear and they don't want to ask everybody what, what, what all over again. Um, so it looks like they're trying to control the conversation, but it's only because they're embarrassed that they can't hear. But other times, talking a lot when others are silent can make you look overbearing. Failure to listen can be a barrier. 
pat answers. That means you cut them short. Illness and disability can be a barrier and age. And honestly, I have to at least five times a week ask my daughter, what does that mean? Because there are so many new words in the new age um, that I don't know. Residents with disabilities, a person may acquire a disability anytime from birth through old age. People with disabilities have the same basic needs as you and everyone else. And they have the same right to dignity and respect, just like you and everyone else. Okay, care of the comatose person. The person who is comatose is unconscious. They cannot respond to others. They can often hear, and they can often feel touch and pain. So many times you'll have people come out of a coma and be able to tell you what was said during the time that they were unable to respond. So even though they're in a coma, you always knock before you go into the room, tell them your name, the time, and place every time you enter the room, and try to give care on the same schedule every day. They, um, I've even had a friend who was a paramedic and she was telling me so many times she has transported people that were unconscious. By the time she got there, when they came around, they said, thank you for telling me what you were doing. I was so afraid. So there's so many times that they can hear, they can understand, but they can't let us know that. So always, always assume that the person who is comatose can hear and feel touch. They just can't tell you and a lot of them can't even move. So we have to help them in every way, but always assume that they can hear. Okay. Um, explain what you're gonna do step by step as you do them. Tell them when you're finished. Use touch to communicate care, concern, and comfort. Tell them what time you will be back to check on them and tell them when you're leaving the room so they know that you're no longer there but then tell them when you come back. Um, always give them that respect. And you should do that with other people as well, because I've seen people who don't. But the comatose person deserves all the same respect and dignity as anyone else. Um, family and friends help meet safety, security, love, belonging, and self-esteem needs. Um, they offer support and comfort. They lessen loneliness. Often they'll help with the person's care. As long as they're safe to do that, and as long as the person doesn't mind, make sure that it's okay with the resident before you let them do that. Um, my mother and my grandmother both would wait for me to come to the facility to give them their baths. That's okay. They were modest. They didn't want strangers giving them a bath. But then you have other people who don't want their family to. One fella, his, he was in the facility. Um, his granddaughter came to visit from California. And so I went in the room and I said, um, if you don't mind, I just need to get him cleaned up a little bit. If you want to step out, run down to the cafeteria, I'll be done before you get back. And she said, oh, I'm in my second year of nursing school. I can do that. And the grandfather went, I didn't know. He didn't want his granddaughter seeing his body. And so I said, well, that's okay. I think I've got this. Um, you can just step out and we'll be done in just a few minutes. And she said, are you sure, Grandpa? And he said, I'm sure. And so, um, but just be aware of that because even though the family is trying to be helpful, it might be an uncomfortable moment for the resident. The presence or absence of family or friends can affect the person's quality of life. Um, so if they are coming to visit, that's a wonderful thing. But if they shouldn't make the person tired or upset, just try to be aware of those kinds of things and let the nurse know so she can intervene because that happens too. The resident is the most important person in the center. Learn as much as you can about their religion, their cultural beliefs and practices. Illness and disability affect quality of life. Always focus on ability and always treat the family and visitors with respect as well.